Good morning. Um, hello, welcome along to Ammonford Evangelical Church's online service. It's really good to have you with us. If this is your first time, then a real warm welcome. My name's John. I'm one of the pastors at the church. Uh, if this is your umpteenth time, then welcome back to you. I hope you're doing well. Well, as we're getting into January, it's our second Sunday in January already. I wonder if you're feeling full or empty. There's lots of ways you can answer that question. You could think of your full stomach from all of our Christian Christmas feasting. Um, and now feeling a bit empty if you're into Christmas, uh, post-Christmas, January diets and saying no to things that we said yes to a couple of weeks ago. Or you could answer that to do with your family. Um, maybe you feel full because you've had a wonderful time with people that you love over the last couple of weeks. Or maybe it was an empty time for you, somebody missing from the table, somebody that um, has passed away in the last in the last year, somebody who should have been there, but they're not there anymore. And so maybe it's been an empty time for you. And maybe you feel that just in your own soul. Maybe you feel full and ready to attack the year and really looking forward to, to what 2022 has to come. Or maybe you just feel exhausted already. Maybe you feel like you've done things that just couldn't be forgiven. That you were empty and you've made yourself empty. Or other people have put that on you and left you empty. I don't know. Do you feel full or empty at this time of year? Well, if we just look for answers to that question in the things around us or in ourselves, we'll just go through a cycle of going up and down, full and empty. And that's an exhausting thing to go through. So there's better news in the Bible. Um, Paul, who's one of the early leaders of the church, he wrote down a prayer, a prayer all about fullness, a prayer for a church that he loved, for the people that he loved. And this is what he prays for them. Have a listen to how he talks about fullness and all that belongs to us as Christians in this prayer. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be opened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. See, he wants our eyes to be opened to how full we are already, the hope that we have, how good a God he is, how much he loves us and sees us as his inheritance. So he prays our eyes would be open to hope, to see that we're his inheritance and to know his incom incomparably great power for us who believe. The same power, his mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above every rule and authority, power and dominion, over every name that people call upon in the world, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Do you see where real fullness is found? It's not found in our circumstances and how happy we are. It's not found in ourselves and how good we've been lately or how, how well we're doing at keeping our resolutions. Fullness is found outside ourselves in the one who made us. Fullness is found in Jesus, our Lord. It's found in his glorious Father. It's found as the Spirit opens our eyes to all that we have in Jesus as we come and trust in him and, and put our lives in his hands. So why don't we use that as a prayer now, the beginning of our service. Let's pray that God would fill us up, then that, he, that we'd be full enough to be sent out to bring that fullness into the lives of others. Lord, we thank you so much that you are our living Lord, you are our saviour. We thank you that you bring us to your glorious Father, that we can call God our Father now. And Lord, we thank you that you pour into us your Holy Spirit so that we know day by day, we get to know better and better as you open our eyes, the hope that you've called us to, how much you love us as your inheritance. And Lord, the power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead that now lives and works in us. Lord, we pray that that would be our um, reality today, that we would know this power, we'd know this hope, we'd know how much you love us, that we'd have our eyes open to the fullness that there is in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would help us to know you better and better, that we'd call upon you and only you, that we'd find everything we need in your fullness. Lord, we pray that this service this morning and through the whole of our lives, we would know you filling us up and then sending us out to pour out into the lives of others what you've so generously given to us. Amen. Amen.
The eleven disciples gathered in Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and he said to them, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, weddings are on the horizon in Amford Evangelical Church. I don't know whether you knew this, but in the last three, four months, three young couples have had the big question popped and the answer returned in the affirmative. And it sparked, I should imagine, a mad rush of act activity, planning, preparing a wedding, frenzy, juggling of dates in diaries to make sure that things fit in and fit in at the appropriate time and order. And one of the things that each of those young couples needs to do before they get married is to come up with a guest list come up with a list of people they want to invite to spend and to celebrate that special day with them. And having come up with a guest list, they'll have to send out invitations. Invitations with times and dates and meal options. I wonder how you feel when that invitation comes, when it's time for the invitations to be sent? Does it get you excited? Oh, the idea of being able to go and to, to celebrate, to buy a new hat, to try on a new suit, to have the fish or the chicken or the lamb or whatever's on the menu. Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Does it make you feel scared perhaps? Oh no, not another situation where I have to make pleasantries and small talks with, with folks I don't normally like to spend time with and to rub shoulders with aunties, uncles, friends of friends that I'm going to meet for a day and then never meet again. Well, maybe it makes you feel sad because you know those invitations are going out and you haven't received one. You're not on the guest list. You didn't quite make the cut. I want us to have that idea of invitations in our mind as we come again this morning to the Great Commission. If you didn't realise, if you're here for the first time or it kind of passed you by last week, we're going to begin our year as a church listening to Jesus' final instructions as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Words which have carried weight for Christians and the church throughout the centuries. But as I reflected on these words this week, I, 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 I stumbled across the thought that these, though they are the final words, are never ever the first words that Jesus speaks to his followers. In the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, Jesus' command to go is spoken loud and crystal clear. It's direct. It's unambiguous. These final words are, well, they're just that. They're final words. But this week, as I've reflected, uh, I've thought about the, the sense in which before receiving these final words, every follower of Jesus might actually hear another instruction or more rightly speaking, an invitation. These are the final things Jesus says to us. But for each of us, Jesus will firstly say this. Come. Come to me. Isn't that true? For all of us who are believers gathered this morning around our screens or gathered in the various spaces that we meet in a Sunday, we are people who have heard and received that invitation and responded to that invitation from Jesus 
Dicker, to come in from the cold and find the warmth of his hospitality, to come in from the lostness, from the wilderness, from a life that is unsafe and that leads to death and come and find safety and security and life. That we've heard Jesus' invitation to us to come home, to come home and finally be in the place, the space, the relationships that we're supposed to be in. Jesus' invitation to us to come and to join him, the son, at the father's table, which is set and prepared for feasting. Jesus' first words to all of his followers is this, come to me, every one of you who is wearied, who is weighed down, who is stressed, who is strained, who is bedraggled, who is outside, who is lost, who is without hope, and find in me rest, find in me comfort, find in me forgiveness, find in me purpose and hope and restitution, restoration in fact. Isn't that Jesus' first words to us? Come. In Matthew's gospel, to the, the people he is now speaking to at the end in chapter 28, in, in chapter 4, this is what he says, follow me, come, follow me. And there's this wonderful promise recorded elsewhere when Jesus says, those who come to me, I will never turn away. Before we hear any other words from Jesus, we hear this invitation to come to him without hindrance, to turn from ourselves, to turn from our old ways and to trust in him by saving faith. Isn't that marvellous that Jesus is one who invites us first and foremost to come? And yet, here we are this morning, we're in the Great Commission, we're going to be here for the next couple of weeks, and the words on Jesus' lips are clear, crystal clear. Jesus says, go. The invitation that Jesus offers to anyone as they begin to follow him is never the final word he speaks. I cut short that quotation about the first followers. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, this is what we read. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, said Jesus, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they heard their master's voice, and they obeyed. They left their nets, it says, and they followed him. You see, woven into the invitation that Jesus extends to each and every one of us to come to him, into woven in that is the command to go. Those Jesus invites to come, he also commands to go. To put it another way, as I've read it this week, saved people are always sent people. Saved people are always sent people. In John's Gospel, Jesus said this to his followers, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. In Matthew's Gospel, in the Great Commission, Jesus says, all authority is mine, and I say to you who follow me, to you who have come, go. So here's a question to get our brains ticking over this morning. Is the Christian life about coming to Jesus or going for Christ? Is it about accepting that first invitation or is it about obeying that later instruction? Are those two things even mutually exclusive things? Well, let's think about this jug of water, this bowl of water that you might have seen off to the side. I think the Christian life is something like this, and this will help us to see how it's the, the both and. It's the two together. Here is Jesus, this spring, this fountain of living water, who says to all who are thirsty, come to me and your thirst will be quenched. You will never be thirsty again. 
The Christian life is about coming empty as we are in need of the water, the thirst quenching, life giving the water that Jesus offers. We are to come and to fill ourselves up. That in Jesus there is always enough. That we can be filled up when we come to him. But that's not the end of it. That is the beginning of it. It is by no means the end of it. Because Jesus puts us and places us in and around and amongst other folks who, like we were, are empty, who are thirsty, who are searching and needing that life-giving water to quench for themselves. And so he tells us, he commands us to go, having come and being filled, to go and to take that water, to take him, to take his kingdom, to take what he is about and to, to give it freely to those around us who need us need it. Jesus, who has invited us to come, then sends us. Go, take that with you. And we are people who can keep coming back to Jesus and staying full so that those around us who are empty can also be filled up. You could also uh, use the illustration of a flame, of a candle, of a fire, That Jesus is this all-consuming fire and we're invited to come and to be set ablaze by him by drawing near. But we're to take that fire, that flame, that light that he has given us and to take it into dark places. That what we have received, we are supposed to offer and to give. In fact, when you stop and when you think about it, that is the pattern, that is the picture that Jesus uses to describe the Christian life, and he himself embodies, isn't it? A couple of times in John's Gospel, when Jesus is speaking about being that living water, and he says those who come and who drink, they find this fountain, they find this life, and they too become streams of living water. Or elsewhere, where Jesus is described as the light of the world, where he describes himself as the light of the world. He says, those who come to me will no longer be in darkness, but will have light. They won't just be in the light, that they will have light. Able to take that light and shine it into dark places. Jesus is one who exemplifies for us through his life and through his actions, that what he has isn't to be kept to himself, but is to be spent for the value, for the enrichment of those around us. That just because he is full, just because we come to him and we are filled, that doesn't mean it stops there. We should be spreading, we should be giving, and that is where life truly comes. So I say to you this morning, if you are not a Christian, there is this invitation to you today. Jesus is one who says to us, come. He is one who says to you, come. And that invitation to come is to find forgiveness in him. It is to find hope for a future in him. It is to find a status and an identity in him. But it's to something more than that as well. It's not simply about being invited to come and to belong, although that in itself is a wonderful thing. It is an invitation to come and to be a part of something, an active, participatory part of what he is doing, something lasting and something truly important. When we say as a church, as Christians, you should come to know Jesus, you should come to trust in Jesus, you should depend on Jesus for life. That isn't just about receiving, that is about being invited to be a part of what he is doing, cosmically speaking. That is a wonderful invitation. And our encouragement to you this morning, if you're gathered with us, we love having you here, is that you would look to Jesus and you would respond, that you would be brought in, that you would want to be a part of that. But for those of us who have responded, have heard that invitation, have RSVP'd, yes, we want to be a part of what you are doing, then there are two dangers I want to warn us of this morning as we hear Jesus' command to go. Two problems, and neither of them are appealing or useful. 
I broadly speaking put them like this. The first problem is becoming stagnant water, staying where it is. It may be added to, but it stinks and it causes death. That's the first problem. The second problem is being empty vessels, perhaps offered to others, but ultimately becoming useless. Let's think about that first one, about becoming stagnant water. It, it doesn't even really make sense. It doesn't really even make sense because I'm not sure truly that we can come to Jesus to behold him, to enjoy him, and not want to scream his name from the rooftops. But there it is. More often than we care to admit, Christians and the church can become stagnant water. People who receive Christ into us and there it stops. It doesn't flow from us. Michael Green, uh, an evangelist in the 20th century who I had the privilege of spending some time with, put it like this, the church exists not for itself, for the water to flow into it and to stop there, but it exists for the benefit of those who are not yet members. And here is the warning, the church which lives for itself will surely die by itself. Sometimes we can have this attitude that all the Christian life is about is us receiving, is about us being filled, and that is the terminus, that is the end of it. Our gaze never looks up from ourselves or outside of our four walls, and it makes us stagnant, it makes us stenchy, and ultimately it will lead us to death. Maybe it's expressed in that attitude of, we don't mind others hearing, but if they want to know, they know where to find us. That's a dreadfully sad attitude to have where we expect those who are lost to somehow find us in order to be pointed to Christ. Imagine Christ having that attitude of being stationary, of being still, of not wanting and seeking avenues for, for that water, that life to flow out of him. Imagine Jesus holding on to something so that, so that he could benefit rather than us. It wouldn't lead anywhere. It wouldn't lead to hope. It wouldn't lead to life. It wouldn't lead to glory. No, Jesus' pattern that he has lived out is to give what he has. To give the thing which leads him to the point of death. Maybe we empty ourselves for the sake of those around us. And that ultimately brings more life, more glory for everyone involved. Jesus, who has invited us to come truly, if we have responded, if we know who he is, is too good, too good to keep to ourselves. That's the first problem, potentially, for us as Christians or us as a church, that we are stagnant water, that we seek to fill ourselves up with Jesus and it goes nowhere. Very big danger. Danger number two is that we actually having come to Jesus, having responded to his instruction to go, to, to, to spread that light that we have, that flame that we have, to share that living water that we have so enjoyed, that has so quenched our thirst, is that we've gone, but we've now become empty. That the water that once flowed into us in Jesus has ceased to flow. It's, it's, if you like, the other end of the spectrum, where perhaps Christians and churches have so felt the, the pressure of always being active, the pressure of always being productive. They've so caught the vision of the Great Commission of spreading Jesus' glory and his fame to the ends of the earth and inviting others to enjoy him, that they've forgotten to enjoy him themselves. They've sought perhaps to seek Jesus with others and become cold towards him, distant from him. They came once, then they heard the command to go, but somehow they missed the idea of remaining and abiding and drinking from him continuously as they go. And that is a tragedy because ultimately we end up being in a place where we're no use to anybody. 
We have nothing to take when we have left Jesus behind. And those are two real dangers for us here in our church, in our time, in our place. That we become selfish and stagnant and live as if Jesus is simply for us. And the Christian life is about fattening ourselves. Truly, we will stink and that stench will become death. Or we'll get so caught up in this vision of sharing Jesus and making him known that we'll for actually forget him for ourselves. And we'll become fruitless and we'll become ineffective because we can't share a Jesus who we don't enjoy ourselves. So this morning, as we come to that great commission, as I've reminded us that Jesus invites us to come and then commands us to go, he instructs us to go, here are two things that I think we should be doing big picture wise to make sure that we truly are followers of Jesus disciples of him, listening to our master's voice. They're two really simple things, and I'm going to give three suggestions of ways we can do these things for both of them, okay? Two headlines, three subpoints each. We need to fan the flames, and we need to spread the fire. We need to fan the flames, we need to spread the fire. Fan the flames of our love, of our joy, of our hope, of our faith in Jesus for ourselves. How do we fan that flame? How do we make sure that we stay full to the brim, that we are filled with living water, that we are in the light and have the light? Three ways. Number one, don't be a stranger. We don't talk about Jesus, perhaps because we don't talk to Jesus. Surely the most fundamental element in any Christian's life should be this, an ongoing, personal relationship with our Saviour. That's what we've been invited into. So if we want to continue to be a people who love Jesus, who wake up with hope, who wake up each day with joy, who seek his peace and his kingdom, then we need to be a people who talk to Jesus, who spend time with Jesus. So if you want to fan the flame of your affections for him, then don't be a stranger. You won't fall more in love with him by staying far away. Don't be a stranger. But secondly, surround yourself with others who love Jesus. And I don't mean by this, get into a tight holy huddle to the exclusion of those outside the church. Clearly, I don't mean that. What I mean is that there's truth in that picture of calls that come together, who share their warmth, who the warmth of one warms the other and keeps the fire burning. Perhaps part of the reason that you have become cold towards Jesus, that your affections have waned over time, is because you haven't surrounded yourself with others who love Jesus deeply. Don't be a stranger to him, but surround yourself with others who love Jesus as much, if not more, than you do. Tip number three for fanning the flame is to rehearse regularly to yourself his ongoing grace in your life. I think as Christians, we find it very easily to say dispassionately that God has been gracious to us. How has he been gracious to you? How has he been loving? How has he been kind? He sent his son to die for me so that I can be forgiven and I can be with him forever. But the Bible paints a picture, the Bible introduces us to a Jesus who isn't just kind to us once, but is ongoingly gracious and merciful and loving and kind. If you want to fan the flames of your affections for Jesus, then another thing that you can do, apart from spending time with him and surrounding yourself with others who love Jesus, 
is to remind yourself, to rehearse regularly his ongoing grace in your life. It's, it's a difficult thing to do, especially for us British people, us Welsh people. We love to complain. We love to mourn. We find it more difficult to share thanks, to share encouragements, to look and to see how God is active in our lives. Not has been active, but is ongoing active in our lives. Fan the flames. Don't be a stranger to Jesus. Surround yourself with others who love Jesus and rehearse regularly his ongoing grace in your life. But what about the other point then? How do we not just fan the flames? How do we spread that fire? Listen to this. Don't be a stranger. And now I don't mean don't be a stranger to Jesus. I mean don't be a stranger to other people. We cannot share Jesus. We cannot speak for Jesus or live for Jesus in full view of other people if we keep them at an arm's length, if we keep them at a distance. And I know we're in a period of pandemic. I know that we're, we're still under restrictions and lockdowns and people are scared and people have shielding letters and this and that and the other. But there are means, there are ways that we can still draw close, that we can still draw near to people. We can spread that fire by not being strangers, by opening up, opening ourselves up, becoming vulnerable towards other people, listening to them, talking to them. How do we expect to share Jesus with others if we don't know or relate to anybody else? It's obvious. Don't be a stranger. Surround yourself, secondly, with those who need Jesus. I said for the first one, surround yourself with those who love Jesus. Now surround yourself too with those who need Jesus. Can I be honest with you? That when you do, when you spend time in the company of those apart from Jesus, sometimes it can feel like, sometimes it can look like they have life better than you do. That they're exercising freedom in ways that you wish that you could. They have a license to, to selfishness and to sin in ways that you're probably envious of. But you know, it doesn't take long spending time with folks. You don't need to look so deep before you see how desperately everyone around us needs to hear Jesus's invitation to come, to find rest, to come, to find peace, to come to find forgiveness in him. Surround yourself with those who need Jesus. And it might make you feel uncomfortable. It might make you mourn for a while the, 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 the life of sin that you once led. But you spend long enough there and you will see just how desperately people need what you have. Thirdly, rehearse regularly his ongoing grace in your life, not privately now, but publicly. We've trained ourselves perhaps at the very least, or sometimes the very most, to speak of Jesus, of God's goodness and grace to us in salvation. But we're weak at speaking about how he continues to be a day by day God to us, how he continues to be a day by day Lord and Saviour how he is a master whose voice is worth listening to and entrusting ourselves to. If we are truly fanning the flames by staying close to Jesus, by surrounding ourselves with others who love him, by rehearsing regularly to ourselves his ongoing grace, then we get to spread the fire. We get to spread the fire by being close to other people, surrounding ourselves with, by people who need Jesus and regularly rehearsing his ongoing grace in our lives in front of them. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is one who invites and instructs. It's not an either nor, it's a both and. That is a wonderful thing that Jesus calls us to fill ourselves to such an extent that we become an inexhaustible source for those around us. So fan the flame. As we head into 22, fan the flame. Spread 
the fire. That's what it is to live the Christian life. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for the invitation. We thank you for the instruction. We thank you that to be a Christian is to be a part always of something more. Something more than our small and our limited view of life and the world and indeed our relationship with you. Forgive us, Father, that perhaps we have grown cold towards the Son. Forgive us, Father, that we have become and grown cold to those that you have placed us amongst. You promise to be with us. You promise to equip us. You have sent the light into our lives. You have given us the water of life in Jesus. Lord, I pray that we will drink deeply from that well. We will come close to that fire that we can but be set ablaze by it. Lord, I pray that we would not be a selfish people, a gluttonous people, a greedy people who keep that to ourselves, but freely would want to share it. Help us more and more to come and to go, to fan the flame and to spread the fire for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord Jesus, our great Saviour, help us to see your love towards us from the manger where you were born to the garden of your agony, the cross of your suffering to the empty tomb of your resurrection, to your seat now, even in heaven, as you pray for us. Knowing this love for ourselves, this truth, we can have courage and strength to stand against all foes, to stare down our temptations, to resist the schemings of this world and to remain bold for your name. Deepen our sense of oneness with you, the wonderful with the weary. You have loved us with an everlasting and an unchangeable love. Help us to love you in return. You have given yourself for us. Help us to give ourselves wholly to you. You have died for us. Help us to live for you. In every moment with our time, in every movement with our minds, in every pulse with our hearts. Lord, we face so many distractions, distractions from you. Lead us to walk beside you, to listen to your voice, and to find ourselves entirely in your grace. Amen. Well, we're getting towards the end of our time together, so um, time to wrap it up and say thank you for joining us. I um, hope it's been something, a, a real blessing to you, something that has filled you up and reminded you of the fullness that we have in Jesus. Um, thank us, thanks as well to Sammy and to everybody else who's played a part in putting together this week's video. Uh, as we always do, just finish with a couple of notices, a couple of things to remind you of for the week to come. Um, the first one is that this evening, if you're watching this on Sunday morning, this evening at 6pm in our Wind Street church building we're going to have a prayer meeting and pray for the world so not just for ourselves and for our, our town here but we're going to lift our eyes up and pray for the world around us so 6 p.m um, if you fancy coming down we'll be socially distanced and everything like that it'll be um, safe and a good place to come and gather to pray um, pray god's blessing on the world around us um, the second thing to say is if you're new to this christianity thing or you just like a bit of a refresher on the basics of of what it means to to know Jesus and follow him, of who he is, of what he's done, of what that really means for us. Well, we're going to be starting up a, a course that will kind of run for a few weeks, hopefully have dinner together and catch up and ask all of our questions, all the honest questions you've ever wanted to ask in a safe environment, that kind of thing. And we'll be starting up one of those courses before. If you might have heard of Christianity Explored or the Alpha course, it'll be something a bit like that. So if you're interested in that or you think you've got a friend or a family member who might be interested, um, drop us a line, amonfordchurch.com. You'll find a contact page there or on Facebook, on YouTube, in the comments. Um, get in touch with us and we'll get back in touch with you and give you some details of that. Well, I hope to see you soon in the flesh. Um, but if not, then uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>